So advanced drawing, uh, we are looking at, um, we're just getting back from spring break. So we're gonna sum up some, and then we're gonna look forward to what we're doing next. So sum up, um, I just put in um, a sketch assignment, which is actually part of the comic book assignment. So when you go into Google Classroom and it gives you a list of things, um, I wanted you guys to know that that you're still like your sketch work is really important for your comics, and I want to see it so that um, you guys are seeing that you're getting credit for doing all the work. So I put in a separate thing that's called sketch, and under that you see character studies, and it says advanced drawing. Um, we are looking at, and I put in two helps. One help is a whole bunch of different facial expressions, and it just shows eyes and mouth, how to kind of make a facial expression from that. And then um, the other uh, one is examples of character displays. So uh, different head shots, different body views, front, side, back view, um, also called FFs, FSBs, uh, but I don't think I abbreviated that for you guys. Uh, we should have finished and turned in your inspiration um, a while ago. I'm hoping we did that a while ago. Some of you guys still owe me that one. And then um, we're looking at your either did a comic book, a cover, and two inside pages, or a comic strip. One week's worth of comic strips, Monday through Friday, and a double set for Sunday. Um, if, you, if you say, hey, Abel, which one is the easiest one to do? It's the same amount of work. Uh, the difference is, is uh, the comic book cover has to be color and the Sunday paper should be color. Uh, the inside of the comic book can be color and the daily strips can be black and white or color. So, so it works out to about the same. Uh, the difference is, is how you do your layout, how you make your gutters, how you make the cells for your panels. Uh, and um, it's different because it depends on how you're doing your story uh, for, for either one. So uh, we're gonna start looking at getting comics in and to us. So that brings us to our, our next idea. Hey, Abel, what are we gonna do next? So our next thing that we're going to do, and since we have such wonderful news yesterday, I feel you guys are probably getting a little emotional. So we're gonna do expressive self-portraits. So let's talk about self-portraits. What's some of the things you guys think we need to have in a self-portrait? Our face. Excellent way to start. Yes. Face. Now we're gonna make a definition of face and head. Head is the entire, your whole melon. Face is just pretty much from above your eyebrows to your chin. Um, it's this area. This is face and this is head. So we definitely have to have face in there. Um, the expression and how the emotion is drawn, definitely. Because there's two different ways to handle this. Um, your expression is one, but it depends on do you want your emotion tied to the expression you're making or are you going to have the emotion demonstrated in through your drawing technique. So uh, when, we, when we're thinking about this, and I'm about to pop up for you guys, images of high school students, a lot of us, um, if we struggle with drawing the face, we're going, to, we're going to try to make this a little bit easier on ourselves. I would make the expression part of my facial expression. So if this is tough, that's my facial expression. My facial expression is part of my, is the exact part of my drawing. Now, if we have no problem drawing faces and we have no problems with getting people drawn, um, maybe we put our expression in what's around or the colors that we use. So when we say face, um, our definition of face is going to be one eye, part of a nose, part of a mouth and an ear. And then it sits on something, it's not just floating in space, it maybe has a neck or something to go with it. So that's our face. Um, for this, the minimum is your atypical, what you're seeing right now in frame, headshot. Head, neck, shoulders. 
no knees and toes. You don't have to have those if you don't want. You can do um, a bigger picture. Angle. So this is a pretty much direct angle. This is a profile shot. Um, this is a little above eye, and this is a little below eye. I'd move the camera around, but I'm being lazy right now. Uh, you can get more creative in your angles. You can do foreshortening. Does anybody remember what foreshortening is? Nope. I got two no's, I got three no's. All right, so foreshortening is an artistic trick where we exaggerate the size of an object. So here's how we're gonna do this. Oh my gosh, this is the first time I've ever done it with a camera, this would be kind of cool. So you guys all get a good look at me. And you see my two thumbs. Thumbs are the same size, right? Hold my thumbs up and we're gonna do a little trick. If I pull one thumb back, and I push one thumb forward, they're different sizes now, aren't they? Get down uh, on technically. They look different, but yeah. our brain says, nope, they're the exact same size. They don't change size, they change distance. So in a drawing, to show that change of distance, we exaggerate size. We actually physically make this thumb bigger and this thumb smaller. And if I do this, whoop, whoop, whoop. if I do this, this thumb becomes almost bigger than my head. And this thumb is much smaller in its appearance. So I draw different sizes. Nice thumb. It's a good, that's a nice thumb. That's a good one. The camera's not good enough for you to get my fingerprints, so haha. <laughs> Um, though the government sealed those records. So we can do a thing called foreshortening. And foreshortening is distortion of size in an image so that we give a deeper depth of space. So one of the cool ones, um, uh, Dali did a beautiful Christ pose where the Christ is laid out. And we have these big old feet because the body lays backwards in space. Uh, we know that towards the end of the Renaissance era, we're starting to see some of that foreshortening appear in artwork. It's no longer flat set pieces. We're starting to play in with space. So I can do things like, oop, oops, see if I can do this without tipping my chair. My feet are much bigger than my head, but in reality, Tip of toe to back of heel, the same size as top of head to bottom of chin. Same size as tip of toe to back of heel, wrist to forearm. But in this, my shoe is much bigger because it's closer to you, the viewer. And I, though I'm gaining weight, unfortunately, am much smaller because I'm so far back. So that's a foreshortened view. This is a foreshortened view. Comics use foreshortening inside of their display. All right, so I'm gonna show you some examples off of the internet of student work self-expressions. Are you guys ready? Absolutely. I knew it. I said to myself, this is, I'm working, I'm working my dynamic angle here. I need to get my views up for YouTube. So. Just type in expressive self-portrait and images of expressive self-portraits. Going through the top, these are definitely high school works except for this guy. Uh, Vincent Van Gogh has probably one of the nicest bodies of work over a 10 year period of self-portraits. One, he couldn't afford models and so he used himself a lot. Frida has a very unique expression in her portraits. So we have two Van Goghs right here. We have one Frida Kahlo. Um, excellent, excellent artists to look into for this project. Um, we're gonna talk about these guys in a second, but let's look at these high school style artworks. Very flat plane, um, no foreshortening, uh, probably a little bit 
out of proportion when we look at the hand um, as it's laid out for the body. I mean, if you try to hold your hand like that, it's probably not a comfortable way to hold your hand. Um, looking straight ahead, but very expressive. Her face is not expressive and her face is not correct proportions, but the background here is very expressive. And then this idea of a world evolving from her, very expressive. Oh man, I wanted this one to be bigger. Let's see if we can, oh, darn it. So um, art four or advanced placement, woohoo. So we have this expressive look. He has an emotion and we kind of get the feel like he's sneaking a peek at something. Very nice shading, great layout for the whole piece. Um, very nice proportioning for head to hands and good proportion from hand to hand on the side. So those are some nice ones. Um, the pictures of the people drawing themselves, really cool idea. Uh, it's a little bit overplayed um, in the fact that you see it online and then there's always somebody who wants to try to do something like this. Not a bad thing to do at all, though not super expressive. This guy here, that's a really expressive one. Um, it looks like it's uh, charcoal on grayed paper, but we have this really nice white highlight inside of here, these beautiful tones to the face, a little disproportionate in size, but uh, that's coming with the expression he's doing on his face. So again, this is a self, this is a face locked expression. That's an extremely expressive face right there. Uh, it, it's again, Forward view, flat, um, we're not seeing an ear, but I would probably forgive not having an ear with all this beautiful tonality, especially when we look around the neck. Um, the lips look a little bit kind of, this part of the face looks a little distorted from the rest of the face, but really cool hair, really cool look to it. Um, this is, to me, I would guess, though technically drawn, um, probably not a great high school work, but I think this is definitely a high school work. And um, it's slightly expressive. The face has no expression, but we can see some things kind of happening into it. The closer your proportions are, I, I believe the, the better you are going to like what you're doing. Uh, this is a definitely interesting play on color. So we have complementary colors, um, light to dark blue with light to light yellow to an orangish red. And then you have this green hair kind of popping through. Um, if we scroll down a little bit, we have a girl with purple hair. Again, yellow, orangey, red face, um, but a green background this time. And then this one here, uh, the orangey background and the orangey face with these nice blues kind of really pull. We'll come back to Frida. Uh, this one here, this is also, Face is kind of plain, but we get a very definite kind of emotional feeling of what's happening in a lot of these issues here. Uh, good use for pastels. I know uh, Carson likes pastels, so good use of pastels inside of this. Uh, this guy here, I'm thinking that guy could use a little work. Uh, when we come down through, uh, we'll come back to Vince. This is kind of an interesting statement uh, with the hands sort of covering the face, but still keeping the face shape. Uh, we can see where they have a little bit of issue. The ears aren't correct. Um, the biggest issue with a lot of these, eyes, nose, mouth, we're not laying out a good head. Uh, we're not having correct proportion spacing for eyes, nose, mouth. Whereas opposed to this one, we have a little bit better proportioning eyes, nose, mouth. Uh, halfway down the head, between here and here to chin, that's halfway. Between here, nose to mouth to chin, this is halfway. So this is a having rule. Having these better facial proportions, this is a beautiful angle. Um, having these better facial proportions helps out, I think, with a more realistic, believable picture, even when we're doing things that aren't necessarily believable in the picture. All right, so let's talk about Vincent Frida. Uh, Vincent Van Gogh, and as you go through, 
<laughs> Harry, Harry Potter bingo. As you go through Vincent's, we have a stern pose on his face, but there's a lot of emotions and it's in the style of painting that he uses. His brush strokes were thick. He was working rapidly. Whenever you, you, you never get a sense that um, even though it's a static pose, there's a sense of always something motion or moving happening inside of it. And he is well known. Now this is not Vincent. This was one of the people um, uh, where he lived in the south of, and this was uh, south of France. Um, but he has these very stoic looks to him as he would stare at himself in the mirror. And we can see, you can see his hair changing. You can see his facial structure changing. Um, you can tell like where he was in his life emotionally and mentally by these pictures. But all of them seem to have this captive motion and it's done by his, his brush strokes. Really interesting colors. Vincent was always well known for using um, how he used his palette and how he used his colors. So the expression here isn't being shown on the face as much as it is, it is the painting environment around it. And Frida, where did my Frida go? Oh, there she is. Frida is well known for not being a photorealist, but showing things as they really were. And she kind of over exaggerates. You see, um, if you ever see a picture of Frida, her, she didn't have that bad of a unibrow, but she used to really paint it heavy. At times, you see her give herself a little mustache in some of her pictures. Uh, again, kind of a static face. Uh, she has a little bit more of emotion, I think. Um, both her and Vincent um, had, a, had a lot of personal struggles, and I think it, you can see it in even their stoic poses. But we have these beautiful colored backgrounds that are really kind of drawing us to the picture, what's being said here. And then we have these little hints of things. And if you really get in and decipher what's going on inside of her pictures, there's a lot of hidden meaning and a hidden message. So for your work, I want to see a self-portrait. I want to be able to know it's you. But, and the but is, the expressive part of it is how you're going to handle this project. So if I say I struggle drawing myself or I struggle drawing people and this proportioning is hard for me to get, then I'm going to stick with a simpler pose and I'm going to stick with simpler expressions. How am I going to put the expression into it? If I am confident in how I lay out a face and how I draw a person, then I'm going to challenge myself to push the angle of view and the type of expression that I'm showing. So my expression might be my background is expressing a, a color and I'm changing the colors in my face. Um, it might be I'm changing my camera angle. To be more dramatic. Um, I'm changing. Oops. Uh -huh. Can't wait to see video reviews on this one. Um, I'm changing how I'm handling the space and my face. So uh, you can add in things. Uh, the guy peeking through the window blind, really cool picture, really great idea. What if you're seeing it from the outside as he peeks through? What if you're seeing it from behind the person. If it's behind the person, how are you gonna show me that you can get eye, nose, mouth in correct proportions? Um, maybe you don't use a traditional mirror surface. Maybe we're using something that has a reflective surface, but it's unnatural or something that normally isn't, reflect, isn't used to do a reflection. So, I can play with all those. Uh, um, it needs to be done on color or done just with pencil um, and add color through different ways. 
it does not have to be color. Uh, again, we saw some beautiful charcoal ones. We saw some beautiful pencil drawing ones that are expressive and um, the person, and it's all done pencil. Um, you can use color. Color is an easier way to show an emotion. If I'm sad, I use blue. If I'm happy, I use uh, bright colors. Um, if I'm excited, I use excited color values. So you can use color to help you out. Um, if I'm gonna use color, it doesn't have to be realistic colors. So both Vincent um, and Frida use pretty much realistic colors for their faces, but their backgrounds maybe aren't realistic colors. Uh, we saw several examples and I think of um, the girl with the blue hair and the orange face and she's, ah, very expressive colors and not realistic at all. So I am looking at you demonstrating good, strong drawing skills, good proportions for human face, good layout and use of your paper. And that's what I'm looking for. Those three things done to the best of your abilities and then how are you pushing your abilities um so i don't want you to play the comfort zone it's easy to do this or this um i want to see how you're you're pushing that the creative part comes in with your level of challenge you're going to judge your ability and how are you challenging that ability um, if you play it safe, you're, you're not growing. So I want you to challenge yourself inside of it. How are you going to make this not difficult for you, but pushing where your comfort zone is from? Maybe your comfort zone is, hey, I'm really good at people, but I'm not super good at shading. So I'm going to push my shading values. Uh, maybe you feel very comfortable in shading, but you don't like how you draw faces. So we're gonna work on making that face in better proportions. That's the plan for this project. Uh, I would like to have sketches um, Thursday of you in reflective surfaces. So I'll put that homework up. Um, we'll say three to five sketches on one sketchbook paper, not three to five pages, just one paper with three to five sketches on it. Uh, sketches, not super, I mean, you can go into some details, but, but uh, you shouldn't spend hours on this. You know, um, three to five should take you 45 minutes tops, 15 minutes minimum. And that is our lesson for today. I'm feeling pretty good. Beautiful. That's not just me, right, Cole? I think it's all you. Carson's got a question. Go for it. Um, what is the difference between Prisma and Xena colored pencils? Um, let me look up Xena color because I'm not a hundred P what Xena is. Uh, I would guess it's in the pigment of the pencil. I know that um, Xena color pencils. There we go, blank. Um, Check out Amazon. Amazon says they get pretty high ratings. That just tells me what they've got. Okay, let me look at their website. Um, looks like somebody just copy and pasted this and put it onto Amazon. They have a 100% uh, satisfaction guarantee. This pencil makes me draw bad. I want back my money. 
Look at that blonde hair. Thanks, wife. Um, okay, so right now I'll show you guys what I'm looking at. Uh, we're looking at a picture of them. So a little bit of pencil anatomy here, uh, color core, and then you can see the split in the wood, which makes me a little nervous. I mean, all pencils are, are two parts. Um, they don't like pour in the color. They have a color shaft and then they put that in and then they glue the two parts together. But the fact that I see these seams, so like this, I can't see the seams on, cool. Uh, the two different colors, okay, I should see a seam because they're two different colors. But these guys were the, the same color. That makes me wonder how well their glue process is. Um, hey, look, the pencil's sharpened. All right, that's not a really great picture. Um, that's all the pictures we have. Do they have examples? Let's look at what it says under designs. Oh, look, they've got country designs. Um, well, I don't want that. I'm gonna say this without ever have used, used them. Um, they have a pretty full line of art supplies. I would think that it's just another company. Uh, I know this, I've used Prisma pencils and uh, they are meant for professional quality. Uh, Prisma does make a student grade pencil. Um, so in the classroom, I have the really nice Prisma pencils that I keep for advance. And then I have some Prisma pencils that I bought this year for um, the general drawing class. And uh, the difference is, is how the pencils lay down their colors. Um, how the how the pigment is made and how the pigment is bound together. On the student side, um, blending isn't as easy uh, because of that pigment mix ratio. To me, uh, the Prisma it's a high quality pencil. If you if you pay if you pay for it, you you get the quality that you pay for. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that everything I pay for is is worth it. Uh, there are some great German companies that make awesome pencils, uh, but my Dick Blick pencil set works out just fine. Uh, and it's, it depends on how you're using it. Without ever having to use the Xena color, I'd, I'd have to practice them. I'd have to see what they do. Um, statement is, I do like how easy it is to draw with color. Uh, with Prisma, but I don't know if. Um, I haven't used them and I don't know if you can buy them locally. So, okay, I'm gonna go back and check. On Amazon, the 160 set is $45. That's, that's not a bad price. Um, if I look down below, and I look at some of the other ones uh, that are around that price range. So that's them. Um, their price range puts them at the lower end of pencils. Um, it might just be, it might just be that, that they have a, a better price point. It says they're soft, uh, soft, um, fine and precise mine. That's a really weird statement. Quality pigment. Um, they're showing little kids using them. They're using, they're showing color book pages. I am guessing by their advertisement, um, they're advertising to, uh, adults who like to do adult coloring books and they're advertising to for little kids. So it could be on the same, they might be on the same standard level as a Crayola pencil. So a waxier content, um, blending, blending may be more of a stack color as opposed to a mush together um, true blend of a color. So at that price, I mean, 45 bucks, that's still a lot. I, I might see if I could find a smaller set. Um, their box looks nice. <laughs> uh, 
do, do, do. I'm looking right now is how they say the pencil's designed. 3.3 millimeter thick. Uh, I would say, you know, if you if you type in Prisma pencil um, to get 160 Prisma pencil, you're probably going to pay three times as much at least. I know to get the pencils that that we have at school, the big box, um, we get it for educational discount and without an educational discount. When I personally bought my big box of Prisma pencils, it was one of those things I bought myself as a Christmas graduation birthday present. <laughs> and, and it was my first big box of Prisma pencils and they were great. But the downside to it was, is they were so expensive. I didn't use them that much because they were so expensive. So then I ended up bringing them to school and letting students use them. Um, I would say this, so this is an old, this is an old craftsman saying, it is a poor craftsman that blames their tools. So if you can learn to work with cheaper materials, then when you get better materials, you should be better. Um, but it's, it's, it's the person who says, oh, I can't, I can't do the work because I only have this. Um, sometime look up the Crayola artist here. We'll look him up real quick because uh, he does he does expressive self-portraits what helps if I spell right that is not the guy that well, helps because I probably forgot a why Hey, you guys ready for this? Cole, I hope you're sitting down. Olivia's ready. So I'm showing you um, these are done with Crayola crayons. So this guy here, Jeffrey Roberts, And um, he started with his grandkids playing um, with Crayola crayons. Where the heck is his pictures? And so he had all these like little crayons laying around and he's like, well, I think I'm gonna try to do something and he started using Crayola crayons to make images like this. Yep, those are my doggies barking. Oh, gosh, I love them. Probably the mailman. So the streakiness is indicative to, like you can see the pressure, the scribble strokes happening, um, but if you really sit down with a Crayola crayon, you can make some very impressive things happen. Again, it's a poor craftsman that blames their tools. This is done not because the crayon did it, it's the artist who makes these marks. Because this is an artist making marks. Lighter strokes, layered together, nice blends, very nice color coloration. Is it harder to do with a Crayola crayon? Yes, harder to do with a Crayola crayon, but not impossible to do. And if you can do this with Crayola crayons, then when you get to quote, fine material, end quote, then you should be able to um, work better and your better might be working faster, working at a higher level um, because you practiced using simpler materials. And you have to work harder to make these materials do the same thing that a nicer material does. I'm going to just 
take an odd moment there to think that this was done with the with only the 24 pack because I see a little bit of metallics unless those are non-metal metallics. Uh, but this can all be accomplished with Crayola crayons. So if I can do that with a Crayola, then when I get to my higher level materials, I just have to learn to work with them and I can build nice things. I can do nice things. So this is just as an artist controlling my media, controlling myself to make my, my stuff better. So if it's in your price range and you can afford it to get 160 different colored pencils, go for it. Just remember that it's gonna, if it's a lower quality pencil when you get it, then you're going to have to do you're going to have to do higher skill to make it function. The only thing I would state is um, Crayola for uh, one time did a like a high school grade pencil, and to do that uh, they made it a little bit harder core so that you could sharpen it and get it to a nice point on a colored pencil, which necessarily isn't needed. Um, but the shafts were so fragile that half the time just taking them out of the box, just shipping would cause damage to them. And they no longer make that line. Um, they went back to their, their standard pencil size, but the pencils were thinner. Um, and Prisma had a very thin pencil that was the same way. And, and the, there's nothing more frustrating than sharpening a pencil, going to draw and having the, the lead or the graphite or the colored core just fall out in little chunks. Um, so if it's poor quality, poorly made, then it's going to give you a problem and that's upsetting and frustrating. But if it's cheaper materials, then it takes, then it's your skills. It's your skills to make it better. That is a long answer. All right, guys and gals. Um, <laughs> Um, that was my brother, that, that was my boy and girl upstairs just having a little bark fest. That's two days in a row now. They're getting used to us being home. Actually, spring break really didn't help because we had a, uh, I would take some time when I wasn't working on papers and I'd spend a lot of time with them because it helps my stress. All right. If you guys have any other questions, we can answer them. Otherwise, we're working on finishing up uh, previous work and we're working on going to portraits. Olivia has a question. So way in the back, go ahead, Olivia. Okay, so her question is about the comic project, go for it. You know, if you guys have mics, you can just turn on your mics and you can talk to me that way. All right, so um, the question is, uh, I have a story, but I don't know how to draw it. Okay, um, can I, I can't seem to get certain types of scenes drawn, um, if that makes sense. Yes, so you have two options. Um, let's say it's the scene itself. So you wanna have a car chase and you're having a hard time drawing cars in motion. What I would do is, I would now with the wonderful use of Google is I would type in like car chase or car scene and I'd look through until I find one that, that fits. Um, if you're having a really hard time drawing something, 
a, a little trick you can do is you can take your piece of paper, you can hold it over the monitor, and um, unless it's the tag board, then you can kind of trace off of your computer screen. Uh, if it is, I did put out some tracing paper at, high, at the high school, or if you have any newsprint that's really thin, and you can trace it onto that piece of paper and then practice doing your lines. So I trace out something that's difficult and then I practice drawing my lines so that my arm, my muscles, my tendons are moving in the directions that I want my scene to develop. And then when I'm comfortable about it, then I go in and I start to draw it into my comic paper. Um, if you have a light table, I have a light table at home. Uh, you can do that. You could go over if you do a tracing and you trace it a couple times and you're still not, if you're still not drawing it well, you could take a Sharpie and, um, or any, any not name brand because they're not paying us, but any dark marker and you could go over the, the sketch lines and then hold that up to a window and hold up your comic sheet over the top of it. And then you can lightly pencil it on and then remove it. Um, and some people are like, well, okay, is that cheating? Um, if you're having a hard time drawing and you're not able to move forward with your idea because you're stuck on this, it's not. It's, it's a tool to get you forward. Uh, a lot of times, especially in the comic industry, so we're talking about just the comics right now, in the comic industry, if I can't draw the character the same way the artist who does it draws, sometimes those people will use light tables and, to, and they will practice over the top of the real one until their work mimics the other artists. So, so you're, you're okay um, to do that. Um, I have a question too. Uh, so does two characters that look the same count as the same character, even though the two characters are slightly different? Um, so let's say I have uh, Sam and Steve, and Sam and Steve are, are the same type of characters. Actually, oh, where's my sketchbook? My sketchbook is somewhere else. Uh, my two characters, I'm not going to pull up all this stuff. Um, my two characters, uh, Sam and Steve, they're both skunks, so they should be the same. So to make them so, and here's the problem. If the characters are the same, how does the audience know when one is doing stuff and one isn't. And your statement is color different. Okay, so they have on different colors. Um, Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, pretty much the same character. One wears a dress and has a bow on its head and the other one doesn't. One wears pants. So when you look at the body types, very similar body types, uh, difference by color. For mine, I'm, I have a different haircut. And then when you see them from the back, they have a different pattern to them. So as long as there's a distinction between the two characters, you're, you're cool. It's two characters. Um, and, uh, and that means, though, I still do all the sketch work. So I do the front side back for each character. I just show some different clothes. Maybe um, the color, not only the color is different, but maybe how the clothes sit on them. If you look at Charles uh, Schultz's Peanuts characters, they're all very similar character designs. Uh, it's just they have a little different tweak in each one. They have a little different clothing in each one. So slightly same characters, okay. Uh, tracing over something until you get the motions or you use it as a transfer, still okay. Does that answer our questions a lot ease? I got a, I got a, a one. Okay, thanks. Yes. Can I use vanilla paper? Oh, um, for the, for the, uh, you can use any paper you got. I'll tell you that. It doesn't matter for comics. It doesn't matter for the self-portrait. Any paper you want. Um, when you say vanilla paper. Uh, I think of um, like my one time teaching elementary. Um, I think of that paper that kind of reminds me of construction paper. 
And again, um, so if it's if the paper is a little bit lighter or easily torn, just be careful with it. Otherwise, any any paper you want is is cool with me. <laughs> All right, guys and gals, I think. Man, we took up we took a, a good chunk today. This guy could take a bit to compress. I have a quick question, I think. Hit me up, Cole. So like for the comic strip, there's only eight frames. Or what? Um for a comic strip on a daily strip, the daily strip itself is anywhere from two frames to two panels to five panels. On a Sunday, it's usually two or three stack. And here's, here's the difference, is if on the top stack, I have the first uh, panel is my title and introduction, then usually I only have one or two story panels after that, and then I have two more below it. Um, so total could be eight frames. Um, but on a daily strip, it's usually two to five, and the average is four. So if I'm looking at a piece of paper like this as my daily strip, this is one daily strip, and it's anywhere from two to four panels, maybe five panels. Um, if this is my Sunday strip, title, panel, or two panels, and then three or four, three or four, and that's my Sunday strip. So when I talk about doubling, the double part is the daily strip amount, not including the title for a Sunday. Um, I actually just saw, oh, got another movie for you, for you guys, Secondhand Lions. Um, Secondhand Lions, older movie, kind of a tearjerker, so make sure you got some tissues with you. Um, oh, let's go like this. Oop -a -doop. All right, so we're going to share a screen quick. Yoink, yoink. Uh, Bloom County, really like Bloom County, uh, Berkeley, uh, Breath. And I say, and I saw Secondhand Lions because he did the, the comic work for Secondhand Lions. Um, if we go to his website, um, he does a lot of cellless panels. So let's see if I can just pop up just this one. This is a Sunday strip. It is title of comic, author's name, and he is the sole proprietor to this comic. So he is author, he's writer, artist, um, which means drawing, inking, painting. He does all the lettering. So this is one title page. And we have the main character here standing on his soapbox talking. Um, actually, is this a current comic? It is, April 3rd, because I just noticed Opus is wearing a mask. Um, then we have cellless panels. There's still a gutter that's happening, but instead of having an outlined cell, he leaves it open framed, open frame cell. So it's still a panel, um, just no cell frame. And then we have one, two, and he actually did a third traditional strip. So when we're looking at this, love the advertisement off to the side, silly Google ads. Um, when we're looking at this, this is a lot of Sunday work. If you said, hey, Abel, what do I need? You need a title and you need two sets of, of um, panels going on two sets of panels. If I want to see a daily strip, so we got to go back, she booped. This 
is an example of a daily strip. Instead of title appearing inside the comic, title is on top. Uh, the reason there's 2015 is this is when it came from 2015. And then artist name can either be on top or sometimes on bottom, but as a true artist, it's signed inside of the last panel. But here we have panel, cell wall, action, onomatopoeia, because that's an action word. He is yawning and it's describing what's happening. It's the action of the scene. Um, we hop over, uh, we have our characters interacting. Instead of having speech bubbles, it's, a, it, it's again, it's a non-walled bubble. Um, and we still have a, a point heading to the speaker. Um, and we can tell that these guys have actually um, dialogue going on. Um, we can tell by the size of the dialogue and the um, thickness of the lines, how much they're emphasizing words. Um, here we'll hit another random one. So more of a kind of closer again with the bubble, um, but this bubble is done again without a, a wall to it. And then we have character interacting with voice from the woods. So th this is a daily strip. That's what you need to have. Can a daily strip be smaller? Yes, a daily strip could be just two panels. Um, could it be just one panel? Um, if you go to a one panel strip, you're looking more at like the comic Herman or Family Circle. Family Circus. Um, it used to appear just a quick little hit in the comic strip. So sometimes you'd have words going on here, but really we have an interaction happening below, autograph. Um, if you were doing something like this, you would do four of these per quote day um, to make the same amount, to make the same amount. Eventually this go, did go to strip form. So I gotta go back one. Oh, gotta wait for my menu to not be there. So, and then this becomes more of a, a strip and kind of descriptive. Uh, sometimes you had these like little maps going on. And that was his Sunday strip. His Sunday strip was more of a full page splash. Sometimes you would have like these interactions, but this is a very kind of short, it's not even a story, it's just an antidote to what's happening inside of it. Um, for us, we're looking at more of daily strips or comic comic books. Does that help, Cole? Mm, kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. What can I'll I do. make clearer? I'll live. I'll manage. Yeah, so but like, does it matter how? Like, how many boxes do you think I would need? So, if I'm if 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 I'm holding down to, I like. Monday through Friday, four boxes each day. Okay. And then Sunday, a title box, and then eight other panels for that day in color. So would I have a title at the top or what? So for my Sunday, we're going to go back to, to Bloom County. Um, well, like for the whole thing too. So it... The daily strip title is different than the um, Sunday title. So this is a daily strip title. Title is above my comic, author's above my comic. He has his copyright information in the margin and he should have his signature somewhere in one of the panels. Usually the last panel might be over here. Um, but you, as an artist, you wanna have that protected. Um, on the Sunday strip, the first panel has your title stuff in it. So each day is like their own story? 
Yeah, well, it could be. Um, sometimes like Snoopy will carry, uh, the Peanuts gang will carry a story through. Um, sometimes, uh, so like Bloom County, uh, sometimes he would do for the week, there's a story that carries day by day by day, and then it concludes on Sunday. Uh, sometimes Sunday starts it, and then it goes for so many days after. Sometimes each day is just a different little comment, and then um, Sunday is its own commentary. So here's some Sunday comics. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes, another, another great one. And it's Calvin and Hobbes, and the last one in here is Bloom County. That's kind of weird. Um, so this first panel, we have Calvin doing something. We have an overlapped panel. But this whole thing is a splash. This is the introduction. Uh, so it's Bloom County and Calvin and Hobbes working together. Um, so you have your two artist signatures up here. And then you have your individual story going on. Um, in a Sunday paper, we always have the title and the artist in the first panel. Always set out that way. So this was his title for a long time. Um, when he switched the comic, same characters, new comic, uh, still first panel is the introduction. When we look at daily strips, they're always set. Um, so this would have been put into the newspaper, but this is how they would have shipped it. So you give me, if you do this once on Monday, and you have your title here. Um, so your title and your name. Your next five don't have to have that on it. Your next five can just look like this. Four panels, four panels, four panels. Um, because your top one would have that. And then when we get to your Sunday, your Sunday will have a panel that is nothing but title and framing. So this is a chance for you to kind of demonstrate lettering you'll have unique letters. Um, it's a chance for you to kind of show off your neatness in your, in your work. And you can see he changes his titles as he goes. He gets a, he gets a little bit, he switches it up every once in a while. Um, if you're doing the same thing the same way all the time and you figure, uh, so a daily strip, the artist isn't doing it the day before. Daily strips are done hopefully months ahead. Um, and so like here we can see uh, this is later characters and she's a little, she's supposed to be a little girl. And so she's colored out Bloom County and she's done her own little strip where she's making them do things. But you still want to, you still want to be able to identify who it is, who's, who's the person and what's the work they're doing. And then daily strips, that's your Monday. And then you can do your, ooh, all of these are, and then you can do your Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, without having to do this part. Cool. So cool. So cool. All right, guys, I think we're, we're good. I'm going to hit stop on recording unless you have that. Carson, you have a great day, too.